for the last week, couple of weeks, I think it's been a time of pretty serious reflection for so many of us as we listen, maybe listen more closely than ever we have. Let me be personal. More closely, I think, than I have after all these years to black colleagues and friends uh, in society in general, but definitely in football. And you're hearing their voice. Uh, um, we may unpack that in a way that probably I haven't heard it before, the depth of it. We'll come back to that. The point of this conversation is that Christians in Sport, which is the podcast, exists to reach the world of sport for Christ. So the specific focus today is how to counter racism in professional football. For some of you, that won't be wide enough. I get that. But that's why I've got the two guests I have, because they really will know what to say about that, because I've got two men, uh, Christian men, deeply involved in the sport. Now, get this, between them, They've played more or less a 1,000 games of professional football, a 1,000 games between them. So they know the crack. You can see them right in front of me. Let me introduce them. Bruce Dyer played nearly 500 league games, scoring 119 goals over 15 years, played under-21s for England. He was the first £1 million teenager moving from Watford, where he started, to Crystal Palace. His club's a legion. Bruce will be here for half an hour. Barnsley, Stoke, Sheffield United, Doncaster, Chesterfield, York. There's no chance we can talk about all of them. Uh, we might pick up on some of this. Uh, he's a founder of Love Life UK, which is a substantial prison ministry, helping people all over this country uh, in prison to recalibrate their lives. And very recently, last couple of years, has become the pastor of Love Life Church in Barnsley. He's got a son at the Barnsley Academy, and that's going to become important, I think, in a minute for us. Uh, the other man in our conversation, you can see, is Bobby Hassel. Uh, he's now the academy manager at Barnsley, but himself played, we've got to say 500, because 499 is just not good enough, eh? <laughs> 500, 499 games in an 18-year career. Big numbers at two clubs, eight years at Mansfield, just under 200 games, 300 games at Barnsley and one season in India. So well-travelled, huge amount of professional football matches. Uh, started in the academy recruitment in 2015 at Barnsley, now head of the academy. Gentlemen, it's a, it's a long introduction. Thank you so much for joining in this conversation with us at a, a significant time. Bruce, I'm going to come to you first. And it's, I, I'm not coming here because it's a simple and popsy and cheap way to start the conversation. But with so many games in your belt, it's such a range from the highest level right across the football league spectrum. How has the challenge of racism changed in your lifetime within football? Um, it, 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 it's, it's changed in this respect. It's changed massively, but then it hasn't changed. It, it has changed in a sense that um, when I first started, people were more vocal with how they fought and their views. And so I remember as a young player making my debut, um, not my debut, I was playing against West Bromwich and a really well-known player um, called me a black C-U-N-T. And I remember looking around thinking, what did you just say? And so early on in my career, people were more vocal and were a bit more blunt how they felt, um, where as time has gone on, I think some people's attitudes haven't changed, but then they just can't be as vocal as they would want to because obviously because of their quality um, and just how they get the game's gone. And so there's been a lot of good changes, phenomenal changes, um, which have been really good, but there's still no, without a shadow of a doubt, there's underlying issues that, are, are, as we know, are becoming more and more evident. And it's the subtlety of those things I invited you two to come because your, your pals, you've worked together at Barnsley uh, and there's a subtlety to, to those things that I'd, I'd quite like us to try and pull out by talking to you both. Bobby, let me pick up on that with you then. When did this issue become something apparent to you or important to you in your career, after your career? What's the nuance of that? Um, well, in terms of the racism, it's from a young age, uh, growing up, playing at grassroots football, and then going into the professional game, 
uh, being a white person, obviously around white players, I heard a lot of racism. Um, the difference with myself, I was brought up in a multicultural school. Uh, my best friend at the time was, was a black and Asian guy. So I seen a lot of different cultures growing up, which I took into my football environment and I was able to integrate with whether it was a black player coming into the dressing room or white. But I did hear a lot of racist comments from white fellow teammates uh, and connotations towards black players, which I had to address as I, as I played, uh, whether it was on the pitch or in the dressing room. They classed it as banter, uh, but obviously it wasn't banter. It's, it was deeply offensive to people if they'd have heard it. Um, so it's always been an issue, uh, as Bruce has alluded to there. I don't think it's ever gone away. I just think attitudes have always been there, but people keep the mouth shut. And then all of a sudden, in the last few years, it seems to have reared its head again uh, for some reason, not just in Europe, but in the English game as well. well just can I pick up on that with both of you? That, that This is one of the things that may surprise some people, right? As, as an older guy than both of you, you know, I can remember the late 70s when whole crowds would be chanting explicitly racist things at players, Cyril Regis's era, obviously, for example. But both of you are saying the underlying issues haven't left. And Bobby, you're saying you think it's become more above the waterline again. I, Bobby, yeah, I, believe, I, I believe so. In the last two or three years, for some reason, me and Bruce have spoke about this regular uh, since, we, since we've met each other and become really close friends. And we, we spoke a couple of years ago that it was just starting to air its head again. Uh, you know, I could hear things in being, a, being at games as a, as a scout, uh, going to different um, environments. I remember Barnsley being in a playoff and there was a, there was a racist comment behind me by a um, fan towards one of our players, which we ended up nearly in a fight. Uh, the steward was there, didn't address him, didn't, didn't throw him out, and I had to move from where I was sitting. Uh, and from that time on, I've heard it at quite a few uh, clubs that I've been to. Mm. Well, you, you've mentioned a couple of times, and Bruce, perhaps you, you could pick up on this for us. You, you two uh, have become pretty close. Your Christian face obviously yeah. must have brought you together. How, just give us a bit of background on that. How did you get to know each other, actually? Were you playing together? Well, we um, so the Barnsley chaplain, Peter Amos, um, used to do Bible study at the club. And so, you know, um, Peter was instrumental in Bobby coming to faith. And so we used to meet at the ground and have a group. And you know, from doing the Bible study, um, meeting Bobby, becoming friends. And then going back probably about, I think it's nine years, um, I really felt in my heart the Lord say to me to begin praying with Bobby. And then when I spoke to Bobby, the Lord spoke to Bobby and says, you need to start praying with Bruce. And over the last nine years, we've built a really, really solid prayer foundation as friends and, and as brothers in the Lord. And that I call Bobby my Jonathan, and I'm sure I'm Bobby's Jonathan too. He's, he's, mm -hmm. he, you know, the Bible talks about there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Um, and I really see Bobby as that person, 100%. We have a real, very, very special bond that I'm, I'm so grateful to God for. And I think it's very profound for such a time as now. And with all the things that we're seeing and hearing that we have a black guy and a white guy that are like brothers from another mother. I call him, he's my, he's my brother from another mother. <laughs> so, so it's a real blessing. Well, uh, certainly uh, for chaplaincy, uh, for those who may not know, and, and many will as they listen into this, so many uh, Premier League and Football League EFL clubs have got chaplains. And my goodness, there are some good men around like Peter Ramos who have been huge any factors of, of presence and love in the lives of clubs like Barnsley. And uh, he's a very top man. Bobby, pick up there for us then. Let, let's hone in a bit now. Uh, in the time then you've worked together and spent time together, you've prayed together, uh, you've been very deliberate in your approach to dealing with the kind of issues we're touching on here uh, in your role as head of academy. And just to clarify this, because uh, this really matters, I think, uh, I said to Bobby, I'd love to talk to you about this. And, and I wanted to make sure that the club didn't mind because you represent your club and they were only too pleased that you'd be on this, in this conversation, talking about the work that's been going on. So start, start talking into how you've tried to address the challenges of racism 
Uh, yeah, well, I, I think it was more about um, bringing diversity into our academy when I first t- took over. I noticed there was only one black player uh, from nines to up to the 18s within the building. We had no black coaches or bank candidate coaches within the, the building as well. And I remember watching, a, I think it was an under 13 game, and I was uh, sat next to Bruce, and I, I remember saying to him, I, there's no black players in the, in the building uh, in terms of the, the academy. And I've been used to playing with obviously a lot of black players in professional football and even in the Barnsley dressing room. And I didn't understand why there wasn't any within the academy. Um, it was no to do with racism. I, I must point that fact that demographically, Barnsley's 99% British white people within the community. And with the ruling that we have in terms of recruiting, uh, they have to be within 45 minutes uh, to an hour and a half within the radius of the club. At the time, there was no recruitment at the football club. Um, so I could kind of understood why there wasn't many black players within the academy. Um, but within the space of the year, uh, myself and Brian Young, we, we went out and specifically looked at recruiting good players. Um, and I was trying to get more diversity into the academy. We ended up bringing in probably between 10, 10 and 15 uh, mixed race and black players at the 18s and 23 groups and uh, in the younger age groups. And I think currently they'll, they'll probably be around 20 uh, to 25 within the academy that are black players. Mm. And along with that, I, I felt it was vastly important that we introduced brain candidate coaches that culturally will understand the black player and the environment that they've come from and the background that they've come from than a white coach. Uh, and that's the reality. A lot, a lot of our coaches didn't understand um, the black players that we brought in from the inner cities of London, for instance, or the inner cities of Chapel Town, which is a black community in Leeds. Mm. Uh, so I was able to bring in uh, black coaches from the inner cities of Leeds as well um, to come into the environment and educate our coaches on how to deal with the cultural differences that there will be within the white community and the black community. Mm. It, interesting for me hearing this, uh, Bruce, because I'm hearing key words and it's a bit more sophisticated than, than my ignorant approach initially. There's something about uh, inclusion. There's something about cultural experience. I hear Bobby talking about actually getting the culture. I start with a negative term, racism. Bobby changes it to something far more positive. Is that, is that fair, Bruce? Yeah. I mean, I, I must say so. My son, who's an under-15 now at Barnsley, he's been, he was at Barnsley from the age of uh, six. Um, and so he was obviously, he was more or less the only black kid there. Um, and so I've seen the transformation and the, the progress in terms of diversity. Um, and, I, and, I, and I really do um, agree with Bobby and, and I give him the utmost respect for just even having the mentality to even understand, to recognise that diversity, equality is important and to try and position staff that can help address those issues. Because I do believe that, you know, I think of the Apostle Paul in the Bible, he said this, he said, I became all things to all people that I might win more for Christ. And so Paul was really intentional about understanding culture. And he made it his goal to understand culture, environments, atmospheres, what people believe in, who they are, their background, so he could build relationships with them to win them for Christ. And then, and I think in the natural, that's so important. You know, I got asked that question by a pastor last week. You know, what you know, what could we do? What what could a white pastor do of a church? You know, give me some advice, Bruce. And I said, well, the Apostle Paul's a great example. He was intentional in trying to understand culture and people's backgrounds and their differences. And, and, and he wasn't partial. He understood the power of love. Um, and, I, and I think that in this season now is so profound. You know, yet we're Christians and we love the Bible and we want to preach the gospel, but what a principle to use in business. Come on, be intentional to understanding culture and people's background. And Bobby's done that, like, hat, hats off. And so he's my good friend, but that had nothing to do with our friendship. That was just him as a coach, a canopy manager, as a, rec- as a recruitment man at Barnsley saying, well, listen, we need some more diversity here. Um, and, and seeing people for who they are, not the color of their skin, but talent is talent. And, and, I, and I think it's been, I think it's so profound, especially 
especially for what we're the position that we're we're in now. It's like wow, oh my gosh, this this this, this broadcast is going to speak to so many people. I, I really do believe that. Mm. Yeah, Bobby. Let's start to draw our ideas in because we want to give people a chance to. I wanted people to have a chance to listen to you to in a very specific context and not generalize. Um. Bobby, where where do you go from here? Uh, you know, what do you what would be a next stage of the development of this ability to understand different cultural backgrounds, make people feel they belong, get the right coaching balance? As uh, for you as a football club, what comes next? And then perhaps I can ask you one more question before I go to Bruce. <laughs> what would you be saying to people inside the game? Who are listening to us now? I know you're a humble guy, but what would you be saying to those of us inside professional football, as some of us become more aware than we've ever been of the importance of getting this right now? Yeah. Uh, I'll address the first question there, Graham. Um, education is obviously massively important uh, in terms of building bridges between cultural backgrounds. Um, the, the human being will always, always go to their own kind. I think if you look from Genesis all the way through in Scripture, these have these cultural issues all the way through. Um, and Bruce, Bruce will back this up now, and you've been an ex-player. If you go into a dressing room, usually what you'll find is the black players will uh, integrate with themselves, the foreign players will integrate with themselves, and then the white players will integrate with themselves. So I think there has to be some breakdown in that. And that comes from a philosophy within within the football club, a concentrated effort to do that. I still now look out look out of my window when other academies come, and I see black players walking out together. I see white players walking out together. Whether that's that's an unintentional thing, that I think it's just the human nature that people are attracted to their own kind as such and where they feel comfortable. Uh, so there needs to be some major breakdown in that. And that, again, that's a cultural thing of being brought up in that environment. Um, so first and foremost, there needs to be some cultural kind of uh, education within football, uh, within industries. Um, and then going on to your second point, Graham, the only, the only people that can change um, the racist connotations within whether it's football or other industries is, is the rich white man. You know, generally it's them that own the businesses, it's them that are CEOs, it's them that are highly educated. And you can't you can't discriminate against people born into riches, born into that uh, environment where they get that education. Um, but there needs to be, it's the only change that can happen with the EFL, the Premier League, um, the FA and all the different bodies is again it's through us you know, i'm talking about the white community here and this the people that, that operate in them them positions they need to have a concentrated effort in terms of recruiting there's lots of ex-black players lots but they're not in positions of authority within the football industry why is that i'd like to know because i don't know there's a lot of really good educated black uh, ex-players that i know highly qualified pro license, got master's degrees, can't get jobs, can't get in the industry. And I want to, I'd want i ask the question why that is, because they apply for jobs all the time. And I know from a recruitment aspect, when we get CVs in, we're looking at certain qualifications and criteria. Um, so these guys, the guys are out there, uh, the people in the authority positions need to answer them questions why there isn't more diversity in the Premier League executive board rooms up and down the land in, in, each, in each football club and each governing body. Mm. Thanks, Bobby. Um, let's, let's round this off. Um, what's got your attention from listening to this? Because we haven't scheduled quite how we're going to ask questions and what we're going to say. And uh, we've asked you both to join us. As you look back over the scope of your career, listening to Bob, uh, you've had a number of clubs, hundreds and hundreds of games uh, at the highest level. How do you see the future now in the light of what's been going on and the conversation we've just been in? How do you see the next two years panning out in English football? Panning out? I, 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 I think there's, there, there, there will be change. I think with everything that's happening, um, without a shadow of a doubt, there's, there's going to be changes. But 
I mean, the other day, um, John Bostock, who plays for um, Nottingham Forest, he did an Instagram and he spoke some really powerful, powerful words. And to make it simple, he said that basically racism's never going to go because we believe as Christians, because of the issue of sin, that there is issues of sin where it don't matter who you are, there's always issues at the heart that we all have to address. And so some of those issues will be racism and the solution to these problems that it can only come through the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, because we believe as Christians that, that the message of the cross is a message of love. And the Bible gives us a clear message of what love looks like. Love is kind, love is patient, love doesn't think no evil. Love does to others is what you'd want them to do to yourself. And so I do believe there's going to be some significant changes, but unless Christ becomes Lord in an individual's heart and people encounter the love of God, we're always going to have these underlying issues. And in its seasons, it's like a seed. When a seed is planted, it waters and it grows. And in its season, seasons, I do believe it will always rear its ugly head. But for me, it's to try by the grace of God. As Bobby said, education is important. You know, the Bible says my people perish because of a lack of knowledge. I do believe some people's actually ignorance and just a lack of understanding and education is so important. And so I really do believe that education is important. I really do believe that it's important in this next season that as Christians, and not just Christians, as, as business people, that just learning to become all things to all people that we might engage and win more people for our businesses, for Christ. Um, I think these are principles that in this coming period we're in are going to be crucial to see and change, which I do believe we will see. But if the truth be told, I don't believe it will ever leave us until Christ returns and gives every single person who belongs to him a new heart, a new body and a new mind. Gents, thank you very much indeed. I know you're both very busy men. Bruce, you must be non-stop pastoring a church in the middle of the COVID crisis. Uh, you, Bobby told me as as you were just coming into the call, he said he's unbelievable. He's on the go all the time. So uh, when a man has to jump into his car last minute uh, to, to get it done, you think, man, he's a busy man. But oh, it's, it's um, pleasure. It's a pleasure to have you on chatting with us. Uh, you've been a huge ambassador uh, in the world of sport and way beyond for many years. Great having you with us, Bruce and Thank Bobby. You. Top man, uh, we honour your work and what you're pulling off and the jobs are getting done and we wish you well.